In this video, I'm going to continue reading from Ralph Waldo Emerson's essays. They were written in the 1800s. Please feel free to share your thoughts, your comments, your feedback, any insights you've picked up whilst I was reading. Please feel free to share it with myself so that we could all gain and benefit from it. I want to thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join me as I read this amazing book. We are currently at page 731, and I shall continue on the bottom of the page. Solitude takes the pressure of present importunities. The more Catholic and humane relations may appear. The saint and poet seek privacy to end the most public and universal. And it is the secret of culture to interest a man more in his public than in his private quality. Here is a new poem which elicits a good many comments in the journals and in conversation. From these, it is easy at last to gather the verdict which readers pass upon it, and that is, in the main unfavorable, the poet is a craftsman, is only interested is only interested in the praise accorded to him and not in the censure though it be just. And the poor little poet hearkens only to that and rejects the censure as proving incapacity in the critic. I'll read this differently. And the poor little poet hearkens only to that and rejects the censure as proving incapacity in the critic. But the poet cultivated becomes a stockholder in both companies. Say Mr. Curfew in the curfew stock, and in the humanity stock, and in the, la and the last, exults as much in the demonstration of the unsoundedness and the unsoundness of curfew, as his interest in the former gave him, gives him pleasure in the currency of curfew. But the deprecation of his curfew stock only shows the immense values of the humanity stock as soon as he saw it with his critic against himself with joy. He is cult he is a cultivated man. We must have an intellectual guilty in all property and in all action. Or they are caught, or they are not. I must have children. I must have events. I must have a social state and history. Or my thinking and speaking want body or basis. But to give these accessories any value, I must know them as contingent and rather showy possessions which pass for more to the people than to me. We see this abstraction in scholars as a matter of course, but what a charm it adds when observed in practical men. Bonaparte, like Caesar, was intellectual and could look at every object for itself without affection. Though an egoist, a outrance, he could criticize a play, a building, a character on universal grounds and give a just opinion. A man known to us only as a celebrity in politics or in trade gains, largely in our esteem if we discover that he has some intellectual taste or skill. As when we learn of Lord Ferex, the Long Parliament's general, his passion for antiquarian studies, or of the French Regsa, regicide Carnot, his sublime genius in mathematics, or of a loving banker, his success in poetry, or of part partisan journalist, his devotion to ornithology. So if in traveling in the dreary wilderness of Arkansas or Texas, we should observe on the next seat a man reading Horace or Marshall or Caltron, we should wish to hug him. We only vary a phrase, not the doctrine, when we say that culture opens the sense of beauty. A man is a beggar who only lives to the useful and however he may serve as a pin or rivet in a social mach machine, cannot be said to have arrived at self-possession. I suffer every day from the want of, of perception of people, of beauty in people. They do not know the charm with which all moments and objects can be embellished, the charm of manners, of self-command, of benevolence, repose and cheerfulness are the badge of the gentleman. Repose in energy, the Greek battle pieces are calm, the heroes, in whatever violent actions engaged, retain a serene aspect, as we say of Niagara. 
that have followed that speed. A cheerful, intelligent face is the end of culture and success enough, for it indicates the purpose of nature and wisdom attained. When our higher faculties are in activity, we are domesticated, and awkwardness and discomfort give place to natural and agreeable movements. It is noticed, it is noticed that the consideration of the great periods and spaces of astronomy induces a dignity of mind and an indifference to death. The influence of fine scenery, the presence of mountains, appeases our irritations and elevates our friendships. Even a high dome and the expansive interior of a cathedral have a sensible effect on manners. I have heard that stiff people lose something of their awkwardness under high ceilings and in spacious halls. I think sculpture and painting have an effect to teach us manners and abolish hurry. But overall, culture must reinforce from higher influx the empirical skills of eloquence or of politics or of trade and the useful arts. There is a certain loftiness of thought, of thought and power to marshal and adjust part particulars, which can only come from an insight of the whole connection. The orator who has once seen things in the divine order will never quite lose sight of this and will come to a fears as from a higher ground. And though he will say nothing of philosophy, he will have a certain mastery in dealing with them and an incapableness of being dazzled or frightened, which will distinguish his handling from that of attorney and factory and factors. A man who stands on a good footing with the heads of parties at Washington reads the rumors of the newspapers and the guests of a pro provincial politicians of provincial of provincial politicians with a key to the right and wrong in each statement, and sees well enough where all this will end. Our committees will look through your continent machine at a glance and judge of its fitness. And much more, a wise man who knows not only what Plato will St. John can show him, can easily raise the fear he deals with to a certain majesty. Plato says, Pericles owed this elevation to the lessons of Anaxagoras. Berkeley descended from a higher sphere where he would influence human affairs. Franklin, Adams, Jefferson, Washington stood on a fine humanity before which the brawls of modern senates are but put politics. But there are higher circuits of culture which are not for the apprentices, but for professions. These are lessons only for the brave. We must know our friends under ugly masks. The calamities are our friends. Ben Johnson specifies in his dress to the muse. Quote, get him the time, get him the time's long grudge, the court's ill will, and reconciled. Keep him suspected still. Make him lose all his friends. And what is worse, almost always to any better cause. With me, thou leavest a better, muse in thee, and with thou brought, broughtest me blessed poverty. End quote. We wish to learn philosophy by rote and play at heroism. But the wise of God says, take the shame, the poverty, and the penal solitude that belong to truth speaking. Try the rough water as well as the smooth. Rough water can teach lessons worth knowing. When the state is uniquely unquiet, when the state is unquiet, when the state is unquiet, a personal qualities are more than ever decisive. Fear not a revolution which will constrain you to live five years in one. Don't be tender at making an enemy now and then. Be willing to go to Coventry sometimes and let the populace bestow on your on you the cold the coldest of contempts. The Finnish man of the world must eat of every apple once. He must hold his hatreds also at arm's length and not remember spite. He has neither friends nor enemies, but values men only as channels of power. He who aims high must tread an easy home and popular manners. Heaven sometimes had just a rare character about with ungainliness and odium. And the bird that protects the fruit, if there is any great and good thing in store for you, it will not come at the first or the second call, nor in the shape of fashion, ease in city drawing rooms. Particularly, popularity is for dolls, quote, steep and craggy, end quote, said Porphyry, quote, is the path of the gods, end quote. 
open your Marcus Antinius. In the opinion of the ancients, he was a great man who scorned to shine and who contested the frowns of fortune. They preferred the noble vassal to late. They preferred the noble vassal to late for the tide, contending with winds and waves, dismantled and unrigged. To her companion born into harbor and colors, flying and guns firing, there is none other social goods that may not be purchased be purchased too dear. A mere amiableness must not rank with high aims and self subsistency. Bettine replies to Gother's mother, to Gother's mother, who chided her disregard of dress. Quote, if I cannot do as I have a mind in our poor Frankfurt, I shall not carry things far. End quote. And the youth must rate at its schumark the inconceivable levity of local opinion. The longer we live, the more we must endure the elementary existence of men and women, and every brave heart must treat society as a child and never allow it to dictate. Quote, all that class of the severe and restrictive virtues, end quote, said Burke, are almost too coarsey for humanity. End quote. Who wishes to be severe? Who wishes to resist the em eminent and polite and in behalf of the poor and low and impolite. And who that dares to it can keep his temper sweet, his frolic spirits. For high virtues are not deep or near, but have their redress in being illustrious at last. Well, the forests of laurel we bring and the tears of mankind to those who stood firm against the opinion of their contemporaries. The measure of master is his success in bringing all men round to his opinion 20 years later. Let me say here that culture cannot begin too early. In talking with scholars, I observed that they lost unruder, com unruder companions, those years of boyhood, which alone could give imaginative literature a religious and infinite quality in their esteem. I find too that the chance for appreciation is much increased by being the son of an appreciator, and that these boys who now grow up are caught not only years too late but two or three bursts too late to make the best scholars of. And I think it a presentable motive to a scholar that as an old community, is it an old community as in an old community, a well born proprietor is usually found after the first heat of youth to be a careful husband and to feel a habitual desire that the state shall suffer no harm by his administration, but shall be delivered down to the next hire in as good condition as he received it. So a considerate man will reckon himself a subject of that secular melioration by which mankind is mollified, cured, and refined, and will shun every expenditure of his force on pleasure or gain which will jeopardize the social and secular accumulation. The fossil strata show us that nature began with rudimental forms and rose to the more complex as fast as the earth was fit for the dwelling place, and that the lower parish as the higher appear. Very few of our race can be said to be yet finished men. We still carry sticking to us some remains of the preceding inferior quadruped organization. We call the millions. We call these millions men. But they are not yet men, half engaged in this soil, pointing to get free. Man needs all the music that can be brought to disengage him. If love, red love, with tears and joy. If want, with his scourge. If war with its cannonade, if Christianity with its charity, if trade with its money, if art with its portfolios, if science with its telegraphs through the deeps of space, and time can set his dull nerves throbbing, and by loud taps on the tough crust, crystals can break its walls and let the new creature emerge erect and free, make way and sink pain. The age of the quadruped is to go out that each of the brain and of the heart is to come in. The time will come when the evil forms we have known can no more be organized. Man's culture can spare nothing, wants all the material. He is to convert all impediments into instruments, all enemies into power. The formidable mischief will only make the more useful slave. And if one shall read the, the future, of the race hinted in the organic effort of nature 
to mount and ameliorate and the corresponding impulse to the better in the human being. We shall dare affirm that there is nothing he will not overcome and convert until at last culture shall absorb the chaos and Gehenna. He will convert the furies into muses and the hells into benefit. Society in Solitude. Society in Solitude is the title of a book Emerson published in 1870. Most of the chapters were already in existence as lectures in 1858 and 1859. Society melted the days like cups of pearl, served high and low, the lord and churl, loved ear bells nodding in a rock, a cabin hung with curling smoke, ring of ache of axe or hum of wheel, or gleam with hues can paint on steel, and huts and tents not lo no loved he less, stately lords in places, princely women hard to please, fenced by form and ceremony, decked by horror, courtly rites and dress, and adequate gentilies, but when the mate of the snow and snow but when the mate of the snow and wind, he left each civil scale behind. Him would God, would gods fed with honey wild, and of his memory beguiled, in caves and hollow trees he crept, and near the wolf and panther slept. He stood before the tumbling main, with joy too tense for sober brain. He shared the life of the element, the tie of blood and home was rent. As if in him, the welkin walked. The winds took flesh, the mountains talked. As he, the bard, a crystal soul, sphered and concentric with the whole. And he, the bard, a crystal soul, sphered and concentric with the whole. That each should in his house abide, therefore was the world so wide. Society and Solitude I fell in with a humorist on my travels, who had in his chamber a cast of the Rondani Medusa, and it was a short, and who showed me that the name which that fine work of art bore in the catalogues was a misnomer, as he was convinced that the sculptor who carved it intended it for memory, the mother of the muses. In the conversation that followed, my new friend made some extraordinary confessions. Quote, do you not see? End quote, he said. Quote, the penalty of learning, and that each of you scholars whom you have met at S, though he were to be the last man, would like the executioner. In Hode's poem, Gullet Guillotine, the last but one. The last but one? End quote. He had many lively remarks, but his evident earnestness engaged my attention, and in the weeks that followed, we became better acquainted. He had good abilities, a genial temper, and no vices, but he had one defect. He could not speak in the tone of the people. There was some paralysis on his will, such that when he met men or common terms, he spoke weakly and from the point, like a flighty girl. His consciousness of the faults made it worse. He envied every dover, every drover, and lubberman, and the tavern, the manly speech. He coveted Mirabirn's done terrible, the la familiarity, believing that he whose sympathy goes lowest in the man from whom kings have most to fear for himself, he declared he would not get enough alone to write a letter to a friend. He left the city. For himself, he declared that he would not get enough alone to write a letter to a friend. He left the city. He hid himself in pastures. The solitary river was not solitary enough. The sun and moon put him out. When he bought a house, the first thing he did was to plant trees. He could not enough conceal himself, set a hedge here, set oaks there, trees behind trees, above all, set evergreens, for they will keep a secret all, all the year round. The most agreeable compliment you could pay him was to imply that you had not observed him in a house, 
or a street where, street where you hadn't met him. Whilst he suffered a big scene where he was, he consoled himself with the delicious thought of the inconceivable number of places where he was not. All he wished of his tailor was to provide that soaked men of colour and cut, which would never detain the eye for a moment. He went to Vienna to Sm Smyrna to London and all the variety of, cost of costumes, a carnival of kaleidoscope of clothes. To his horror, he could never discover a man in the street who wore anything like his own dress. He would have given his soul for the ring of gypsies. His dismay at his visibility had blunted the fears of mortality. Quote, you think, end quote, he said, I am in such great terror of being shot. I, who am only waiting to shuffle on my corporal jacket to slip away into the back stars and put diameters of the sol solar system inside the real orbits between me and all souls, there to wear out ages in solitude and forget memory itself, if it be possible. If it be possible, end quote. He had a remorse running to, to the spear of his social gaucheries and walked miles and miles to get the twitchings out of his face. The starts and shrugs out of his arms and shoulders. God may forgive sins, he said, but awkwardness has no forgiveness in heaven or earth. He admired in Newton not so much his theory of the moon as his letter to Collins, in which he forbade him to insert his name with the solution of the problem in the philosophical transactions. Quote, it would perhaps increase my acquaintance, a thing which I chiefly studied to decline. End quote. These conversations led me somewhat later to the knowledge of similar cases and to discover that they are not of very infrequent occurrence. Few substances are found pure in nature. Those constitutions which can bear in open day the rough dealing of the world must be of that man, an average truck structure such as iron and salt, atmospheric air and water. But there are metals like potassium and sodium which to be kept pure must be kept under naft naft Nefa. Such other talents determined on some specialty, which culminating civilization fosters in the heart of great cities and in royal chambers. Nature protects her own work to the culture of the world and Achimides. A Newton is indispensable, so she guards them by a certain aridity. If these had been good fellows, fond of dancing, important clubs, we should have had no theory of the sphere and no principle. Principia, they had that necessity of isolation which genius feels. Each must stand on his glass tripod if he would keep his electricity. Even Swedenborg, whose theory of the universe is based on affection and who reprobates to weariness, the danger and vice of pure intellect, is constrained to make an extraordinary exception. There are also angels who do not live associated, but separate house in house. These dwell in the midst of heaven because they are the best of angels. End quote. We have known many fine geniuses without imperfection, that they cannot do anything useful, not so much as write one clean sentence. It is worse and tragic that no man is fit for society who has fine traits. At a distance, he is admired, but bring him hand to hand, he is a cripple. One protects himself by solitude, and one by courtesy, and one by an acid, worldly manner, each conceiving how he can the thinness of his skin and his incapacity for strict association. But there is no remedy that can reach the heart of the disease. Be there habits of self-reliance that should go in practice to making the man independent of the human race or else a religion of love. Now he hardly seems entitled to marry, for how can he protect a woman who cannot protect himself? We pray to be conventional, but the weary heaven takes care you shall not be. If there is Anything good in you, Dante, was very bad company, and was never invited to dinner. Michelangelo had a sad, sour time of it. The min min ministers of beauty are rarely beautiful in coaches and saloons. Columbus discovered no isle or key so lonely as himself. Yet each of these potentials, yet each of these potentates, saw well the reason of his exclusion. Solitary was he. Why, yes, but his society was limited only by the amount of brain nature appropriated in that age to carry on the government of the world. Quote, if I stay, end quote, said Dante, when there was question of going to Rome, 
quote, who will go? And if I go, who will stay? End quote. But the necessity of solitude is deeper than we have said, and is organic. I've seen many philosophers who, whose world is large enough for only one person, the effects to be a good companion. But we are still surprising his secret that he means and needs to impose a system on all the rest. The determination of each is from all the others, like that of each tree up into free space. It is no wonder when each has his whole head. Our societies shall be so small, like President Tyler. Our party falls from us every day, and we must ride in a sulky at last. Dear heart, take it sadly home to thee. There is no cooperation. We begin with friendships, and all our youth is a reconnoitering and recruiting of the holy fraternity. They shall combine for the salvation of men. But the remoter stars from the nebula of united light, if there is no group with a telescope, will not there is no group with which a telescope will not resolve, and the dearest friends are separated by impassable gulfs. The cooperation is involuntary and is put upon us by the genius of life, who reverses this as part of his prerogative. It is a it is fine for us to talk. We sit and muse and are serene and complete. But the moment we meet with anybody, each becomes a fraction. Though this stuff of tragedy and of romance is in a moral union of two superior persons whose confidence in each other for long years, out of sight and in sight, and against all appearance, appearances, is at last justified by victorious proof of pro probity. To God the men causing joyful emotions, tears and glory, though there be for heroes this moral union, Yet there are, the two are far off as ever from an intellectual union, and the moral union is for comparative, is for comparatively low, and external purposes like the co cooperation of a ship's company, or a refined club. But how insular and pathetically solitary are all the people we know? Nor dare they tell what they think of each other when they meet in the street. We have a fine right to be sure to taunt men of the world with superficial and treacherous courtesies, such as the tragic necessity, which strict science finds underneath our domestic and neighborly love, irresistibly driving each adult soul as with whips into the desert and making our warm confidence sentimental and momentary. We must infer that the ends of thought were per peremptory, and if they were to be secured at such ruinous cost, they are deeper than can be told and belong to the immensities and eternities. They reach down to that depth where society itself originates and disappears, where, where the question is which is first, man or men, where the individual is lost in his source, but this banishment to the rocks and echoes, but this banishment to the rocks and echoes no metaphysics can make light or tolerable. There is, this result is so against nature, such a half view, that it must be corrected by a, common, by a common sense and experience. Quote, a man is born by the side of his father, and there he remains. End quote. A man must be clothed with society, or we shall feel a certain bareness and poverty, or of a displaced and unfurnished member. He is to be dressed in arts and institutions, as well as in body garments. Now and then a man exquisitely made can live alone and must, but coop up against mo coop up most men, and you undo them. The king lived and ate in his hall of men, and understood men, said Selden. Said Selden. When a young barrister said to the late Mr. Mason, quote, I keep my chamber to read law, end quote. Quote, read law, end quote, replied the veteran. Quote, it is the courtroom you must read law, end quote. Nor is a rule otherwise for literature. If you would learn to write, it is in the street you must learn it, both a vehicle 
and for the aims of fine arts, you must frequent the public square. The people and not the college is the writer's home. A scholar is a candle, which the love and desire of all men will light, never his lands or his rents, by the power to charm the sky's soul, and sits, that sits veiled under this bearded and that rosy visage, his rent and ration. His products are a needful, his products are as needful as those of the baker or the weaver. Society cannot do without cultivated men. As soon as the first wants are satisfied, the higher wants become imperative. It is hard to mesmerize ourselves to whip our own top, but through sympathy we are capable of energy and endurance. Concert fires people to a certain fury of performance. They can really reach alone. Here is the use of society. It is so easy for the great to be great. So easy to come up with an existing. So easy to come up to an existing standard. As easy as it is to the lover to swim, to his maiden, to waves so grim before. The benefit of, of affection are immense, and the one event which never loses its romance is the encounter with the superior persons on terms allowing the happiest intercourse. It is by no means it by no means follows that we are not fit for society because sorrows are tedious and because the sorry find itself finds us tedious. A backward man who had been sent to the university told me that when he heard the best bred young man at the law school talk together, he reckoned himself a bore. But whenever he caught them apart and had one to himself alone, then they were the woes and he the better man. And if we recall the rare hours when we recount when we encounter the best persons, we then found ourselves and then first society seemed to exist. That was society, though in tr the transition of a brig on the Florida Keys. A cold, sluggish blood thinks it has not fact enough to the purpose and must decline it, its turn in a conversation. But they who speak have no more, have less. It is now facts that avail, but the heat to dissolve everybody's facts, heat puts you in right relation with magazines of facts. Capital defect of cold, arid nature is the want of animal spirits. They seem a power incredible, as if God should raise the dead to recluse witness what others perform by their aid. With a kind of fear, it is much as of his possibility as the prowess of Cordelia, or an Irishman Stay work, day's work on the railroad. It is said the present and the future are always rivals. Animal spirits constitute the power of the present and their feats are like the structure of a pyramid. As old as a lord, a general, or a boon companion, before these what a base medin mendicant is memory with his leathern batch. But this genial heat is latent in all constitutions, and it is engaged only by the friction of society, as Bacon said of manners, quote, to obtain them, it only needs not to despise them, unquote. So we say of animal spirits that they are the spontaneous product of health and, a, and of social habit. Quote, for behavior, men learn it as they take diseases, one, one of another, end quote. But the people are to be taken in very similar to doses. If solitude is proud, so is society vulgar. In society, high advantages are set down to the individual as disqualifications. We sink as easily as we rise to sympathy. So many men whom I know are degraded by their sympathies, their native aims being high enough, but their relation all too tender to the gross people about them. Men cannot afford to live together on their merits, and they adjust themselves by their demerits, by their love of gossip, or by sheer tolerance and animal good nature. They untune and dissipate the brave as aspirant. The remedy is to reinforce each of these moods from the other. Conversation will not corrupt us if we come to the assembly in our own garb and speech and with the energy of health to select what is ours, what is ours and reject what is not. Society we must have, but let it be society. Society we must have, but let it be society and not exchanging news or eating from the same dish, it is society to sit in one of your chairs. Is it society to sit in one of your chairs? I cannot go to 
the houses of my nearest relatives because I do not wish to be alone. Society exists by chemical affinity and not otherwise. Put any company of people together with a freedom for conversation and a rapid self-distribution takes place in the sets of peers. The best are accused of exclusiveness. It would be more true to say that separate it would be more true to say that separate as separate as oil from water, as children from old people, without love or hatred in the matter. Each taking it is like, and any interference with affinities would produce constraint and suffocation. All conversation is a magnetic experiment. I know that my friend can talk eloquently. Do you know that he cannot articulate a sentence? We have seen him in different company. So your party or invite none. Put Stubbs and Coleridge, Quintilian and Aunt Miriam into peers and you make them all wretched. It is an extempore sing sing built in a parlor. Leave them to seek their own mates and they will be as merry as sparrows. A high civility will be established in our custom. A certain reverence which we have lost. What to do with these brisk young men who break through all fences and make themselves as at home in every house? I find out in an instant if my companion does not want me, and ropes cannot hold me when they ropes cannot hold me when my welcome is gone. One thing that affinities would pronounce themselves with a sure reper, reciprocity. Recip, reciprocity. Here again. As so often, nature delights to put us between extreme antagonisms, and our safety is in the skill with which we keep the digital, which we keep the diagonal line. Solitude is impracticable, is impracticable, and society fatal. We must keep our head in the one hand. Sorry, we must keep our hand in the one, and our hands in the other. The conditions are met. If we keep our independence, yet do not lose our sympathy, these wonderful horses need to be driven by fine hands. We require such a solitude as shall hold us to its revelations. When we are in the street and in palaces, for most men are, are cowards in society and say good things to you in private, but will not stand to them in public. But let us not be the victims of words. Society and solitude are deceptive names. Society and solitude are deceptive names. It is not the circumstance of seeing more of your people, but the readiness of the readiness of sympathy that imports and a sound of mind and derives its principle from insight, with ever a pure assent to the sufficient and absolute right, and will accept society as the natural element in which they are to be applied. Farming. This essay was first published as one chapter of Society and Solitude. It was originally entitled The Man with the Home and was delivered at the Middlesex Cattle Show. Middlesex quote, Cattle Show, end quote. From September 29th, 1858, Concord was mainly a farming country in Emerson's time. His own property consisted of a house and a 10 acre farm, which was worked for him which was worked for him by hard labor. Although Emerson was not a handyman with tools and implements, he enjoyed gardening and took special, a special pride in his fruit trees and grapes and occasionally took prizes for good fruit and the annual agricultural, at the annual agricultural fairs. To these men, the landscape is an armory of powers, which one by one they know to draw and use. They harness beasts, birds, insect to their work. They prove the virtues of each bed of rock. And like the chemist, mid his loaded jars, draw from each stratum is adapted use to choke their crops or weapon their arts with them. They turn the frost upon their chemic heap. They set the wind to winnow pulse and rain. They thank the spring flood for its fertile slime. 
and on cheap summit levels of the snow. Slide with a sledge to inaccessible woods. Over meadows, bottomless, so year by year. They fight the elements with elements, and by the order in the field disclosed, the order regnant in the yeoman's brain. What these strong masters wrote at large in miles. I fouled in small copy in my acre. For there's no rod, no rod that no root has not a star above it. The cordial quality of pear or plum ascends as, glad, as gladly in a single tree, as in broad orchards resonant with bees. And every atom poises for itself and for the whole. He planted where the del deluge ploughed. His hired hands were wind and cloud. His eyes detected the gods concealed in the hammock of the field. Farming. The glory of the farmer is that in the division of labors, it is his part to create. All trade rests at last on his primitive activity. He stands close to nature. He obtains from the earth the bread and the meat, the food which was not. He causes to be. The first farmer was the first man, and all historic nobility rests on, on possession and use of land. Men do not like hard work, but every man has an exceptional respect for tillage and a feeling that this is the original calling of his race. But he himself is only excused from it by some circumstance, which made him delicate, made him delegate it for a time to other hands. If he have not some skill, which recommends him to the farmer, some product for which the farmer will give him corn, he must himself return into his due place among the planters. And the profession has in all eyes its ancient charm, as standing nearest to God the first cause. Then the beauty of nature, the tranquility and innocence of the countryman, his independence and his pleasing arts, the care of bees, of poultry, of sheep, of cows, the dairy, the care of hay, of fruits, of orchards, the far and forests, and the reaction of these on the working man, in giving him a strength and plain dignity like the face and manners of nature. All men acknowledge, all men keep the farm in reserve, as an asylum where, in case of mischance, to hide their poverty or a solitude if they do not succeed in society, and who knows how many glances of remorse are turned this way from the bankrupts of trade from mortified pleaders in courts and senates, or from the victims of idleness and pleasures. Let me repeat that. And who knows how many glances of remorse are turned this way from the bankrupts of trade, from mortified pleaders in courts and senates, or from the victims of idleness and pleasure. Poisoned by town life and town vices, the sufferer results, while my children whom I have injured shall go back to the land, to be reunited and cured by that which should have been my nursery, and now shall be their hospital. The farmer's office is precise and important, but you must not try to paint him in rose color. You cannot make pretty compliments to fate and gravitation. Whose, whose minister whose he, he is? To fate and gravitation whose minister he is. He represents the necessities. It is the beauty of the great economy of the world that makes his comeliness. He bends to the order of the seasons, whether the soils and the crops, as the sails of a ship bend to the wind. He represents continuous hard labor, year in, year out, and small gains. He is a slow person, time to nature, and not the city watches. He takes the place of seasons, plants, and chemistry. Nature never hurries, atom by atom, little by little, she achieves her work. The lesson one learns in fishing, yachting, hunting, or planting is the manners of nature. Patience with the delays of wind and sun, delays of the seasons, bad weather, excess or lack of water. Patience with the slowness of our feet, with the parsimony of our strength, with the largeness of sea and land we must traverse, etc., the farmer times himself to nature and acquires that level of patience. 
which belongs to her. Slow, narrow man, slow, narrow man. His rule is that the earth shall feed and clothe him, and he must wait for his crop to grow. His entertainments, his liberties, and his spending must be on a farmer's scale and not on a merchant's. If we, it were as fools for farmers to use a wholesale and mass expense as for states to use a minute economy. But if thus pinched on one side, he has a, he has competent, compensatory advantages. He is permanent, clings to his land as the rocks do. In the town where I live, farms remain in the same families for seven and eight generations. And most of the first settlers in 1635, should they reappear on the farms today, will find their own blood and name still in possession. And the like fact holds in the surrounding towns. Their hard work will always be done by one kind of man, not by scheming specu speculators, not by soldiers, no professors, no readers of Tanaisum, but by men of endurance, deep chested, long winded, tough, slow, and short and timely. The farmer has a great health and the appetite of health and means to his end. He has broad lands for his home. Wood, wood to burn great fires, plenty of plain food, his milk at, l at least is unwanted, and for sleep he has cheaper and better and more of it than citizens. He also he has grave trusts confided to him. In the great household of nature, the farmer stands at the door of the bedroom and waits to each his loaf. It is for him to say whether men shall marry or not, early marriages, and the number of births are indissolubly connected with abundance of food. Or, as Burke said, quote, man breeds at the mouth, end quote. Then he is the board of quarantine. The farm is a hoarded capital of health, as the farm is the capital of wealth. And it is from him that the wealth and power, moral and intellectual of the cities came. The cities always recruited from the country. The men in cities who are the centers of energy, the driving wheel, the trade, politics, or practical arts, and the women of beauty and genius are the children of grandchildren, children or grandchildren of farmers, and are spending the energy, energies which their fathers hardly silent left accumulated in frosty furrows and poverty, necessity, and darkness. He is a continuous benefactor. He who digs a well constructs a stone fountain, plants a grove of trees by the roadside, plants an orchard, builds a durable house, reclaims a swamp, or so much as puts a stone seat by the wayside, makes the land so far lovely and desirable, makes a fortune which he cannot carry away from him, away with him, but which is useful to his country long afterwards. The man that works at home helps society at large, with somewhat more of certainty than he who devotes himself to charities. If it be true that not by votes of political parties, but by the eternal laws of political economy, slaves are driven out of slave state as fast as it is surrounded by fate free states. And the true abolitionist is the farmer, who, heedless of laws and constitutions, stands all day in the field, investing his labor in the land and making a product with which no forced labor can complete. We commonly say that the rich man can speak the truth, can afford honesty, can afford independence of opinion and action, and that is a theory of nobility. But it is the rich man, in a true sense, that is to say, not the man of large income and large expenditure, but solely the man whose outlay is less than his income, and is steadily kept so. In English factories, the boy that watches the loom to tie the thread when the wheel stops to indicate that a thread is broken is called a minder. And in his great factory of our Copernician globe, shifting its slides, rotating its constellations, times and tides, bringing now the day of planting, then of watering, then of weeding, then of reaping, then of curing, then of then and storing. The farmer is the minder. His machine is of colossal proportions. The diameter of the water wheel, the arms of the levers, the power of the battery are out of all mechanic measure, and it takes him long to understand its parts, and it's working. The pump never sucks. These screws are never loose. 
This machine, it never goes out of gear. The fat and piston, wheels and tires, never wear out. But are self-repairing. Who are the farmer's servants? Not the Irish, not nor the coal coolies, but geology and chemistry. The quarry of the, quarry of the ear, the wood of the brook, the lightning of a cloud and c- castings of a worm, the plow of the frost. Long before he was born, the sun of ages decomposed the rocks, mellowed his land and soaked it with light and heat, covered it with vegetable fell, then with forests, and accumulated this phagna, whose decays made the peat of this meadow. Science has shown the great circles in which nature works, the manner in which mich- marine plants balance the marine animals, as the land plants supply the oxygen which the animals consume, and animals, the carbon, which the plants absorb, these activities are incessant. Nature works on a method of all for each and each for all. The strain that is made on the point appears on every arch and foundation of the structure. There is a perfect solidarity. You cannot detach an atom from its holdings or strip off from it the electricity gravitation. Chemic affinity or the relation to light and eat and leave the atom bare. No, it brings with it its universal ties. Nature, like a cautious testator, ties up her estate so as not to bestow it all one generation, but has a forelooking tenderness, an equal regard to the next and the next, and the fourth and the fortieth age. They lie the inexhaustible magazines, the in- the eternal rocks, as we call them, we have held their oxygen and lime undiminished entire, entire as it was. No particle of oxygen can rust or wear, but has the same energy as on the first morning. The good rocks, those patient wages say to him, we have the sacred power as we received it. We have not failed of our trust. And now when in our immense day, the hour is at last struck, Take the gas we have hoarded, mingle it with water, and let it be free to grow in plants and animals and obey the thought of man. The earth works for him. The earth is a machine which yields almost gratuitous service to every application of intellect. Every plant is a manufacturer of soil. In the stomach of a plant, development begins. The tree can draw on the whole air, the whole earth, and all the rolling mane. The plant is all suction pipe. And bipping from the ground, from the ground by its root, from the air by its leaves, with all its might, the air works for him. The atmosphere is sharp, softened, drinks the essence and spirit of every solid on the globe. A menstruum, which melts the mountains into it, air is matter subdued by heat, as a sea is the grand recept- receptacle of all rivers. So the air is the recep- receptacle from which. Air is matter subdued by heat. As the sea is the ground receptacle of all rivers, so the air is the receptacle from which all things spring and into which they all return. Invisible and creeping air takes form and sell the mass. Our senses are skeptics and believe only in the impression of the moment. And do not believe the chemical fact, but these huge mountain chains are made up of gases and rolling wind. But nature is as subtle as she is strong. She turns her capital day by day deals never with debt, but with ever, ever with quick subjects. All things are flowing, even those that seem immovable. The adamant is always passing into smoke. The plants imbibe the materials which they want from the air and the ground. They burn that is exhale and decompose their own bodies into the air and earth again. The animal burns or undergoes the like perpetual consumption. The earth burns, the mountains burn and decompose, slow but incessantly. It is almost inevitable. It is almost inevitable. My apologies for that. It is almost inevitable to push it is almost inevitable inevitable to push I'm sorry about that I'll repeat that it is almost inevitable to push the generalization up into higher parts of nature rank over rank into sentient sentient beings 
Nations burn with internal fire of thought and affection, which wastes while it works. We shall find finer combustion and finer fuel. Intellect is a fire, rash and pitiless. It melts this wonderful bone house which is called man. Genius, even as it is, the greatest soul. It is the greatest soul. Whilst all this burns, the universe as a blaze kindled from the torch of the sun. It needs a perpetual tempering. A flame. A sleep. Atmosphere of azote. The lodges of water. To ch check. The fury of the conflagration. A hoarding to check the spending. A centip a centripetence equal to the centrifuges. And this is invariably supplied. The railroad dirt cars are good ex excavators, but there is no portal like gravitation. Who will bring down any weights which man cannot carry? And if he wants eat, knows where to find his fellow laborers. Water works in masses and sets its irresistible shoulder to your mills or your ships or transport. Transports vast builders of rock and its iceberg a thousand miles, but its far greater power depends on its talent of becoming little and entering the smallest holes and pores. But by this agency carrying in solution elements needful to every plant, the vegetable world exists. But as I said, we must not paint the farmer in rose color whilst these grand energies have wrought for him. And made his task possible. He is habitually engaged in small economies and is taught the power that lurks in pretty things. Greed is the force of a few simple arrangements, for instance, the powers of events. On the prairie, you want you wander a hundred miles and hardly find a stick or a stone. At rear interval, a thin oak opening has been speared, and every such section has been long occupied. But the farmer manages to procure wood from far, puts up a rail fence, and at once the seeds sprout and the oaks rise. It was only browsing and fire which has which had kept them down. Plant fruit trees by the roadside, and their fruit will never be allowed to ripen. Draw a pine fence upon about them, and for fifty years they will mature for the owner that delicate fruit. There's a great deal of enchantment. In a chestnut rail or picketed pine boards. Nature suggests every economical expedient somewhere on a great scale. Set at a pine tree and it dies in the first year, or lifts a poor spindle, but nature drops a pine cone in Mariposa and lifts 15 centuries, grows three or four hundred feet high and is and thirty in diameter, grows in a grove of giants. Like a colonnade of Thebes. Ask the tree how it is it was done. It did not grow on a ridge, but on in a basin, where it found deep soil cold enough and dry enough for the pine. It fended itself from the sun by growing in groves and from the wind by the walls of the mountain. The roots that shot deepest and the stems of happiest exposure drew the nourishment from the rest until the less thrifty perished and mannered and manured the soil for the stronger, and the mammoth sequias rose to their enormous proportions. The traveller saw them remembered his orchard at home. With every year in the destroying wind his forlorn trees pinned like suffering virtue. In September when the peers hang heaviest and are taken from the sun, their gay colours come usually a gusty day, which shakes the whole garden and throws down the heaviest fruit in bruised heaps. The planter took the hint of the sequias, built a high wall, or better surrounded the orchard with a nursery of birches and evergreens. Dulcie had the mountain basin in a miniature, and its peers grew to the size of melons, and the vines beneath them ran an eighth of a mile. But the shelter creates a new climate. The wall that keeps off the strong wind keeps off the cold wind. A high wall reflecting the heat back on the soil gives that acre a quadruple shear of sunshine. Quote, enclosing in the garden square a dead and standing pool of air, and quote, and makes a little cuba within it, whilst all without its Labrador. 
Kindness comes to his aid every year by following out some new hint drawn from nature, and now affirms that his dreary space occupied by the farmer is needless. He will concentrate his kitchen garden into a box of one or two lots square, will take the roots into his laboratory, the vines and stalks and stems may go sprawling about in the fields outside. He will tend to the brutes in his tub, watch them with food that is good for them. The smaller his garden, the better he can feed it, and the larger the crop. As he nurses Thanksgiving turkeys on bread and milk, so he will pamper his peaches and grapes on the viands they like best. If they have an appetite for potash or salt or iron or ground bones, or even now and then for a dead dog, for a dead hog, he will indulge them. They keep the secret well and never tell on your table once they chew the sunset complexion of the delicate flavors. See what the farmer accomplishes by a cartload of tiles. He alters the climate by letting off water which kept the land cold through constant evaporation and allows the warm rain to bring down into the roots the temperature of the air and of the surface soil. And he deepens the soil since the discharge of this of this out of the standing water allows the root roots of his plants to penetrate below the surface to the subsoil and accelerates the ripening of the crop. The town of Concord is one of the oldest towns in the country, far are now in its third century. The select men have once in every five years perambulated the boundaries, and yet in this very year, a large quantity of land has been discovered and added to the town without a murmur of complaint from any quarter. By drainage, we went down to a subsoil we did not know, and have found there is a concord under old concord, which we are now getting the best crops from. A Middlesex on the Middlesex, and is fine. And Massachusetts has a basement story more valuable and that promises to pay better rent than all the superstructure. But these tiles have acquired by association a new interest. These tiles are political economists, Confucius and Malthus and Ricardo. They are, they are so many young Americans announcing a better era for bread. They drain the land and make it sweet and friable. Have made English chat moss a garden and will now do as much for the dismal swamp. But beyond the, this benefit, they are the next. They are the text of better opinions and better auguries for mankind. There has been a nightmare bred in England of indigestion and spleen among landlords and landlords, namely the dogma that men breed too fast for the powers of the soil. The men multiply in a geometrical ratio, whilst coal multiplies only in arithmetical and that the more prosperous we are, the faster we approach these frightful limits. Nay, the plight of every new generation is worse than that of the foregoing, because the first comers take up the best lands, the next the second best, and each succeeding wave of population is driven to poor, that the land is ever yielding less returns to enlarging hosts of eaters. Henry Curie of Philadelphia replied, quote, Not so, Mr. Malthus, but just the opposite. Of so is the fact. End quote. The first plant of the savage, without helpers, without tools, looking chiefly for safety from its enemy, man or beast takes poor land. Better land are loaded with timber, which he cannot clear. They need drainage, which he cannot attempt. He cannot plow or fell trees or drain the rich swamp. He is a poor creature. He scratches with a sharp stick, lives in a cave or a hutch has no road but the trail of the moose of bear or bear. He lives on their flesh when he can kill one, on roots and fruits which he cannot. <coughs> he falls and is lame. He coughs. He has a stitch in his side. He has fever and chills. When he is hungry, he cannot always kill and eat a bear. Chances of war, sometimes a bear eats him. It is long before he digs or plants at all, and then only a patch. Lately he learns that his planting is better than hunting, that the earth works faster for him than he can work for himself, works for him when he is asleep, when it rains, when heat overcomes him. The sunstroke which knocks him down brings his corn up. As his family thrive and other planters come up around him, he begins to fell trees and clear good land, 
And when by and by there is more skill and tools and roads, the new generations are strong enough to open the lowlands, where the wash of mountains has accumulated the best soil, which yields a hundredfold of the former crops. The last lands are the last lands, the last lands are the best lands, and they need science in great numbers to cultivate the best lands and in the best manner. Thus, true political economy is not mean but liberal. And on the pattern of the sun and sky, population increases in the ratio of mortality. Credits, the credit exists in the ratio of mortality. Meantime, we cannot enumerate the incidents and agents of the farm without referring to their influence on the farmer. He carries out this cumulative preparation of means to the last effect. This crust of soil which ages have refined, he refines again for the feeding of a civil and instructed people. The great elements with which he deals cannot leave him unaffected or unconscious of his ministry. But the influence of Mark resembles that which the, main, the same nature has on the child of subduing and silencing him. We see the farmer with pleasure and respect when we think what powers and utilities are so meekly worn. He knows every secret of labor. He changes the face of the landscape, put him on a new planet, and he would know where to begin. Yet there's no arrogance in his bearing, but a perfect gentleness. The farmer stands well on the, on the globe, plain in manners as in dress. He would not shine in palaces. He is absolutely unknown and inadmissible therein. Living or dying, he never shall be heard of in them. Yet the drawing room, he was put down beside him, which revel in his presence. He solid and unexpressive. They expressed, they expressed it to gold leaf, but he stands well on the world, as Adam did, as an Indian does, as Homer's heroes, Agamemnon, or Achilles, who he is a person whom a poet of any clime, Milton, Ferdossi, or Curventes, would appreciate as being really a piece of the, of the old nature, comparable to the sun, to sun and moon, rainbow and flood, because he is all, as all natural persons are, representatives of nature as much as these. But that uncorrupted behavior which we admire in animals and in young children belongs to him, to the hunter, the sailor, the man who lives in the presence of nature. Cities whose growth make men talkative and entertaining, but they make them artificial. What possesses interest for us is in natural of each his constitutional ex excellence. This is forever a surprise, engaging and lovely. We cannot be satiated with knowing it and about it. And it is this which the conversation with nature cherishes and guards. Poems. The poetical strain is everywhere apparent in Emerson's philosophy. He is also he was also a writer of verses all his life. Many of them appeared in the dial of which he, Margaret Fuller, and Henry Thoreau served at various times as editor. He wrote many poems to serve as mottos for his lectures. The two principal volumes of poetry published during his lifetime were May Day in 1867 and Selected Poems in 1876. The following poems have been selected from his complete works. Goodbye, goodbye, proud world, I'm going home. Thou art not my friend, and I'm not thine. Ong, through the weary crowds I roam, a river on in the ocean brine. Long I've been tossed like the driven foam, but now, proud world, I'm going home. Goodbye to flattery's fawning face, to grandeur with his wise grimace, to upset to upset wealth's averted eye, to supple office low and high, to crowded halls, to court in tree in street, to frozen hearts and hasting feet, to those who go and those who come. Goodbye, proud world, I'm going home. I'm going to my own hearthstone. Bosomed in young green hills alone, a secret nook in a pleasant land, whose groves, whose groves, the frolic fairies planned, where arches green the lifelong day, echo the blackbirds round delay, and vulgar feet have never trod a spot that is sacred to thought and God. Oh, when I am safe in my sylvan home, I tread on the pride of Greece and Rome. 
And when I am stretched beneath the plants when with the evening star so holy shines, I laugh at the lore and the pride of men, at the sophist at the sophist schools and the learned clan. For what are they all in their high conceit in their high consent? When man in the bush with God may meet The problem. I like church. I like a cow. I love a prophet of the soul. And on my heart, monastic aisles fall like sweet streams or pensive smiles. Yet not all his faith can see what I, that cowled churchman, be. Why should it vest on him a look which I could not on me endure? Not from Iran. Or shallow thought. So awful Jove, young Phidias brought, never from the lips of cunning fell, the thrilling Delphic oracle. Out from the heart of nature rolled, the burden to the Bible old. The litanies of nations came, like the volcano's tongue of flame. Up from the burning core below, the canticles of love and woe. The hand that rounded Peter's dome. And growing to the isles of Christian Rome, wrote in a sad sincerity, himself from God he could not free. He built it better than he knew. The conscious stone to beauty grew. Knowest thou what, what wove you yon wood bird's nest of leaves and feathers from her breast? Or how the fish outbuilt her shell, painting with morn each annual cell? Or how the sacred pine tree adds to old leaves new myriads, such as such and so grew these holy piles, whilst love and terror lay, laid the tiles. The problem, earth proudly wears the Parthenian, and the best gem upon her zone, and morning ups with haste her lids. To gaze upon the pyramids over England's abbey spins the sky, and on its friend with kindred eye, for out of thought's interior sphere, these wonders rose to upper air, and nature gladly gave them place, adopted them into her race, and granted them an equal date with Andes and with Arat, and with Ararat. These temples grew as grows the grass. Heart might obey, but not surpass. The passive master lent his hand to the vast soul that over him planned, and the same power that reared the shrine bestrode the tribes that knelt within. Ever the fiery Penteco Pentecost girds with more flame the countless host, trances the heart through chanting choirs. My apologies for that. Sorry about that. I shall be more careful. And through the priest the mind inspires, the word unto the prophet spoken was written tables yet unbroken. The word by seers of cycles told in rows of oak or fanes of gold still floats upon the morning wind, still whispers to the willing mind. One accent of the Holy Ghost, the heedless world hath never lost. I know which say the father's wise, the book itself before me lies. O Chrysos, Chrysostom, Bess Augustine, and he who blent both in his line. The younger golden lips or minds, tale of the Shakespeare of divines. His words are music in my ear. I see his cowled portrait dear, and yet for all his faith could see, I would not the good bishop be. Uriel, it fell in the ancient periods with the brooding soul surveys, or over the wild time coined itself into calendar months and days. This was the lapse of Uriel, which in paradise befell, once among the Pleiades walking, 
Sight overheard the young gods talking, and the trees in too long pent. To his ears was evident, the young deities discussed, laws of form and meter just, orb, quintessence, and sunbeams. What subsideth, and what seems, one with low tones that decide, and doubt that unreverent use defined. With a look that solved the sphere and stirred the devil ill everywhere, gave a sentiment divine against the being of line, of a line. Line in nature is not found, unit and universe around. In vain produced all round return, evil well bless, and ice well burn. As Euro spoke with piercing eye, a shudder ran around the sky, the stem awoke. Gods shook their heads. The seraphs frowned from myrtle beds. The Rodora. Continue. That was Uriel, and now we're up to the, the Rodora. Seemed to the holy festival the rash word boded ill to all. The balance beam of fate was bent. The bounds of good and ill were rent. Strong hates could not. Keep his own, but all slid to confusion. A sad self knowledge withering fell on the beauty of Uriel. In heaven, one eminent, for God withdrew that hour into his cloud, where the doom to long gyration in the sea of generation, or by knowledge grown too bright to hit the nerve of feebler sight. Straight away, a forgetting wind stole over the celestial kind. And the lips the secret kept, if in ashes the fire seed slept. But now and then the truth speaking things shame the angels' veiling wings, and trilling from the solar course or from the fruit of canic force, procession of a soul and matter, or the speeding change of water, or out of the good of evil born, came Uriel's voice of chillub scorn. And a blush tinged up the sky, and the gods shook, they knew not why, to Rotorua. I'm being asked whence is the flower. In May, when sea winds pierce our solitudes, I found the fresh Rotorua in the woods, spreading its leafless blooms in a damp nook to please the desert and the sluggish brook. The purple petals form the pool. Made the black water with the, the beauty gay. Here might the red bird come, his plums to cool, and court the flower that cheapens his array. Rotora, if the sages ask thee why, this charm is waste on the earth and sky. Tell them, dear, that if eyes were made for seeing, then beauty is its own excuse for being. Why thou would fear, O rival of the rose? I never thought to ask, I never knew. But in my simple ignorance, suppose the self same power that brought me there brought you, humblebee. Early dozing humblebee, where thou art this climb for me, let them sail for Puerto Rico, far off heats through seas to seek. I will follow thee alone, thou animated torrid zone, exact steerer, desert cheerer, let me chase thy waiting minds, keep me nearer, me thy hearer, singing over shrubs and vines, insect lover of the sun, joy of thy dominion, sailor of the atmosphere, swimmer through the waves of air, voyager of light and noon, epicurean, of June, way I proceed till I come within a shot of thy hum, or without his martyrdom. When the south wind in May days with a net of shining haze silvers the rising moor, and with softness touching all. Tends the human countenance with the color of immense, and infusing subtle heats, turns the soft to violets. Thou in sunny solitudes, rover of the underwoods, 
the green sirens thus displaced with thy mellow please he passed hot midsummer's petted crown sweet to me thy drowsy tone tells of countless sunny hours long days in solid banks of flowers of gulfs and sweetness without bound and in the wilderness found of Syrian peace and mortal leisure, firmest cheer and bird like pleasure. Autumn savory or unclean hath my insect never seen, but violets and filberry bells, maple sap and daffodils, grass with green flag half mast high, sacred to mass the sky, columbine with horn of honey, scented fern and agrimony. Clover, catch fly, adder, stung, and briars, roses dwelt among. All besides was an own waste, all was picture as he passed. Eyes of fire and human seer, yellow preach philosopher, a snowstorm. Seeing only what is fear, sipping only what is sweet, thou dost not that faith and care. Leave the chaff and take the wheat. When the fierce northwestern blast cools sea and land so far and fast, thou already slumberest deep. Woe and want thou canst outsleep. Want and woe which torture us. The high sleep makes ridiculous a snowstorm. Announced by all the trumpets of the sky. Ride the snow and driving over the fields seems nowhere to alight the widened ear. High hill, high hills and woods, the river and the heaven, and Dale's farmhouse at the garden end. The sled and trellis stopped the courier's feet. The late old friends shot out. The housemaid sipped. Around the radiant fireplace enclosed in a tumultuous privacy of stone. Come see the north wind's masonry, out of an unseen quarry evermore. Furnished with tile of fierce artificer, curves his white bastions with projected roof. <coughs> Round every windward stake or tree or or door, speeding the merry up amid his wild work. So fanciful, so savage, nor curious he, for numbers of a portion mockingly, on coupon or canal he hangs parian press. A swan like form invades the hidden fawn, fills up the farmer's lane from wall to wall. The more greet the farmer's sights, the more greet the farmer's sighs, and at the gate. A tapering turret over tops the work. And when his hours are numbered and the world in all his own retiring as he were not, leaves when the sun appears astonished art to mimic in slow structure stone by stone, built in an age the man the mad winds might work, the frolic architecture of the snow ODE. Inscribed to W. H. Channing. Thou loth to grieve, evil time, so patriot, I cannot leave. My honey fought for the priest's cat, who states my rent. If I refuse my study for the polity, politique, which at the best is his trick, angry views put confusion in my brain. But who is he that prates that pra of the culture of mankind, of better arts and light? Go blind worm, go, behold the fame of the states, hiring Mexico. With rifle and with knife. Let's read that again so we get it right. If I refuse my study for the politique, which are the bestest trick that angry muse puts confusion in my brain. But who is he that prates of the culture of mankind, of better arts and life? Go, blind worm, go. Behold the famous states, Haring Mexico, 
with rifle and with knife, or who with axe and boulder, they praise the freedom-loving mountaineer, I found by the rushing to coke, and in thy valleys at the coke, the jackals of the negro holder. The God who made New Hampshire taunted lofty land with little men, small pattern men, house in the oak, if a fire cleave the upheaved land and bury the folk, the south and crocodile would grieve. Virtue pulled to his right his hands, freedom praised but it, funeral elegance, eloquence rattles the coffin lid. By boots thy zeal, O glowing friend, thou would indignant rend the north land from the south. Wherefore, to what could end, Boston Bay and Bunker Hill would serve things still, things are the snake. The horseman serves the horse, the neat, neither serves the neat, the merchant serves the purse, the eater serves his meat. It is the other cat, other channel, web to weave and corn to grind. Things are in the saddle and ride mankind. The art to look, the art to laws discreet, not reconciled, lawful men and lawful thing. The last builds the town and fleet, but it runs wild and doth the man a um, king. It is fit the forest fall, steepy graded, mountain tunnelless and shaded, the orchard planted a glebby tiled, the prairie granted a steamer built. Let men serve law for man, live for friendship, live for love, for truth and harmony be off. The state may follow how it can, as Olympus follows Jove, yet do not I implore. The wrinkled shot meant to my sounding words. Nor be the unwilling senator and votes of thrushes in the solitudes. Everyone does chosen work, foolish hands may mix and mar. Wise and sure the issues are, round they roll till dark is light. Sex to sex and even to aunt, the over good who marries right to might, who peoples un. Peoples, he who exterminates races by stronger races, black by white faces, knows to bring honey out of the lion, grabs trans decision. On um, pirate and turk, the Cossack eats Poland like stolen fruit. His last noble is ruined, ruined his last poet may Street into double band, the victors divide, half a freedom strike and stand. The astonished muse finds thousands at her side, forbearance. Hast thou named all the birds without a gun? Love the wood grows and left it on its stalk. At rich men's tables eat bread and pulse. An armed face danger with a heart of trust. And loved so well a high behavior, a manner made that thou from speech refrained, nobility more nobly to repay. Oh, be my friend and teach me to be thine. Foreigners, long I followed happy guides, I could never reach their sides. Their step is forth and ere the day breaks up the leaper and away. Keep my sense, my heart was young, right good boo, my sinews strong, but no speed of mine avails to hunt upon their shining trails. On and away their hasting feet make the morning proud and sweet. Flowers days true I catch the scent, or tone of silver instrument, leaves on the wind mel melodious trace, yet I could never see their face. On eastern hills I see their smokes, mixed with mist by distant locks. I met many travellers who the road had surely kept. They swore that my mind traveller revellers. 
These had crossed them while they slept. Some had heard the fear report in the country or the port. Lead his couriers alive, never yet could one to arrive. As they went or they returned at the house where they sojourned. Sometimes a strong speed they slacken, though they are not overtaken in sleep. Their Julian, Julian troop is near. I tune full voices over here. It may be in wood or waste, at unawares it is coming past. Their near camp, my spirit knows, by signs gracious as rainbows. I thence forward and look after. Listen for their harp like laughter, and carry in my heart for days peace that hallows root, peace that hallows rudest ways. Give all to love, give all to love. Obey thy heart, friends, kindred days, estate, food, fame, plans, credit, and the muse. Nothing refuse. It is a brave master. Let it have scope. Follow it utterly, hope beyond hope. High and more high, who dives into noon with wing unspent, untold intent. But it is a god, known its own path. And the outlets of the sky, it was never for the man, it required courage stout. Souls above doubt, valor unbending, I, it will reward. They shall return more than they were in every ascending. Leave all for love, yet hear me yet. One word more, thy heart behold, or false more of firm endeavor. Keep thee today, tomorrow forever, forever. Free as an Arab, or they be loved. Cling with life to the mate, but when they when the surprise. First vague shadow of surmise, physical so bosom young, of a joy apart from thee, free, free, she, fancy free, nor thou detain with vesture's hem, nor the palest rose she flung from her summer diadem. We're going to end here. Thank you for joining me as I read from this amazing work, from this amazing project of essays within Ralph Waldo Emerson's writings. I just read out those poems he had written, and I figured I'd put in a tune because it would go, go smoother, it would be easier that way. Let me know what you think, and I do apologize for the um, video tapping over in the middle of my reading, I apologize for that. It happened twice, I, I really apologize for that. Please feel free to share your thoughts, your comments, your insights. I look forward to hearing from you. And please subscribe if you haven't already. Please like or dislike this video. And please feel free to do so. What do you think of my reading, my style? How can I improve? Please let me know. I look forward to hearing from you. Have a beautiful day. I love you. Take care. Keep on shining your beautiful light.